Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to Europe, the 72nd and 73rd years of the states. Poem number two of the 29 of By the Roadside. Now, we don't want to confuse this one with the earlier poem, France, the 18th year of the states in the Birds of uh, Passage collection. Um, now, this is another one of the political poems where background is going to matter. No doubt we're going to take a look at that. The thing that makes this poem so fascinating, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of debate. I mean, when I started uh, this series of talks with Walt, as we're calling this series, um, I had any number of Whitman scholars who spoke to me and said things like the following. How are you going to do it? Are you going to go from the very first set of lines, work through inscriptions all the way through, the way that you know it's, it's constructed as a deathbed edition of Lisa Grass? Or are you rather going to do it, which is a really fascinating way to do it, start with the earliest written poems that end up in Leaves of Grass and then work that way, which is a really fascinating way to do it. Now, obviously, we've chosen to just work chronologically. I think it makes the most sense to do it because that's what Whitman wanted. Obviously, the Deathbed Edition is the collection that he was at least, quote-unquote, happy with or content with. But when we pick up a poem like this, we are looking at one of the earliest poems of Leaves of Grass, and here we will see some of the genesis of, uh, of Whitman's style. We're going to ask, uh, what have we already seen in Lisa Grass that would predict this, although this poem is the real predictor, okay, if you got me. And, and what's interesting is the previous uh, poem that we just went with, Boston Ballad, is also a very early written poem, okay? Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net. We mentioned it already down the left-hand side. Uh, talks with Walt again, the title of our playlist, and my hope is that you've been annotating heavily your own copy of Leaves of Grass, a number of you telling me that you're now doing this, and that you're kind of hooked. You're ready always to, you know, kind of read the next set of lines and, and exegete them. Um, we've worked everything from inscriptions all the way up to uh, an introductory set of comments on Roadside. I hope that you've watched that. And then, of course, we just finished, as we said a few moments ago, with Boston Ballad. Now, our Nortons will tell us that this poem is the earliest, there it is, right, of the 12 of 1855, being first published in the New York Daily Tribune of June 21st, 1850, under the title Resurgimus, um, with different line arrangement, occasionally different phrasing. In Leaves of Grass 1855, it was, of course, untitled. In 1856, it was Poem of the Dead Men of Europe, the 72nd and 73rd Years of These States. That's a title. Um, and in 1860, it took its present title. It belonged to no group until it was placed among the Songs of Insurrection in 71 and 76. It was transferred to the present group in, of course, 1881. It was inspired, of course, by the year of revolution, 1848, when uh, Louis Philippe was dethroned in France, Second Republic set up February 26, when Ferdinand I of, uh, of Austria abdicated in favor of his nephew, Franz Joseph, when freedom was proclaimed in Hungary under the Kossuth, um, and when there was also revolts in any number of places, right? Ireland, Lombardy, Venice, Denmark, just to name a handful. So this is a poem that will celebrate warriors, all right? And the cost of freedom, as they say, is never free, the cost of freedom. Now, in some ways, as we've said already, we are watching the genesis of Whitman's style here. And, um, uh, and, and although sometimes Whitman can be political, he's rarely partisan, and several scholars have kind of pointed this out. So let's go to work now with this poem, and let's just enjoy all of the different types of things that Whitman's playing with at level 2B, that rhetorical level, the, the literary style that he is creating. I love that the poem begins with the word suddenly and ends with the word anon, as in come anon. Um, Twelve more times in Leaves of Grass the word suddenly will get used. Suddenly, out of its stale and drowsy lair, the lair of slaves, like lightning it leapt forth. Notice the alighted leapt. Half startled at itself. So you go from suddenly to startled. By the way, this layer, layer of slaves is going to be significant right away for us, no question. Its feet upon the ashes, and obviously now we're personifying freedom. Its feet upon the ashes and the rags. Its hands tight to the throats of kings. Now, uh, this is, of course, very Promethean, very revolutionary. The uh, revolutionary impulse is clearly going to be a, a huge part of what we're reading here. And then 
for uh, three times we're going to get the word O. We're familiar with the way he does this in starting for Pominok in that last section or whatever, right? O, hope and faith. By the way, only time in all these of grass that hope and faith get put together like this. O, hope and faith. O, aching close of exiled patriots' lives. By the way, this whole notion of hope and faith, think about Song of Myself, Passage 6, um, when he's talking about the hopeful green stuff woven, talking about the grass. Oh, aching close. We've seen the word aching already in Leaves of Grass. He is close of exiled patriots' lives. Are you ready for this? One time only in all of Leaves of Grass does the word patriots get used, and it's right here, sitting in the very center of Leaves of Grass, although one of the early, earliest poems. Oh, many a sickened heart. Notice again the alighted uh, sickened, right? Heart. And notice the exclamation points at the end of these three lines. Turn back unto this day and make yourselves afresh. Now, because leaves of grass, as we have said, is so much about evolution, this idea of turning back, this idea of reclaiming the past, this idea of transcend and include, as we've said it often in our lectures, this idea that Whitman is always looking backwards but always looking forwards with the present being the seeds of germination. And I use that phrase, seeds uh, of germination, intentionally, as we'll see. Now, from there, you'll, see, you'll remember he loves to do this where he speaks directly to, and now he's going to speak directly to, in what we call direct address, to the powerful. And you, pay to defile the people. Notice capitalized. Notice the dash. You, liars, mark. And uh, notice we go from layers in the opening line to liars, okay? Mark obviously makes us think about Shakespeare's Hamlet, and, and listen, Mark, pay attention. Not for, notice the repetition of the word for here, not for numberless agonies, murders, lusts, for court thieving in its manifold mean forms, worming from his simplicity the poor man's wages, only use of the word worming in all of Leaves of Grass, and it's, fasc it's fascinating, this use of the word worming, because it has a very kind of earthy feel to it, right? By the way, notice this worming from his simplicity of the poor man's wages. Think about this. Karl Marx will publish Communist Manifesto in 1848. We're talking about a poem that's written two years later in 1850. Fascinating connections, right? For many a promise sworn by royal lips and broken and laughed at in the breaking. We're going to come back to this issue of laugh aloud here in a few moments. Then in their power, again we're talk, talking now to the, to, to the powerful, then in their power, not for all these did the blows strike revenge or the heads of the nobles fall. And obviously we think about the French Revolution here. The people, again, notice capitalized, the people scorned the ferocity of kings. Only use of the word ferocity in all of Leaves of Grass is right here. Now, this is, of course, some pretty radical, rebellious language, no question. In other words, you royals, you powerful, you better remember something because out... Um, uh, uh, of that repression will rise the voice, of course, he would think of Tom Jefferson in the palace who wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, right? The word but. But the sweetness of mercy, what a great line, but the sweetness of mercy brewed bitter destruction and the frightened monarchs come back. Now we're back to this phantom image that's a part of the previous Boston Ballad and clearly was in Whitman's mind right there at the very beginning of Leaves of Grass. We've seen this kind of idea of the apparition of the power of the, of, of the phantom coming to speak. Each comes in state with his train, and now, of course, we're going to get this interesting list of nine. His train, hangman, priest, tax gatherer, soldier, lawyer, lord, jailer, and sycophant, only use of the word in all of Leaves of Grass. Yet, Behind all lowering, stealing, low a shape. And now here the phantom of death is going to be personified. Vague as the night, draped interminably, head, front and form in scarlet folds, whose face and eyes none may see. Out of its robes only this, the red robes lifted by the arm, one finger crooked, pointed high over the top, obviously, now we got prophecy happening, like the head of a snake appears. It's a powerful simile in a volume called Leaves of Grass that here, one of the only times we see this image of the head of a snake coming up. Meanwhile, we, so we go, notice we go from suddenly to but to meanwhile. Meanwhile, corpses, and we're going to get back to corpses four lines later, corpses lie in new-made graves. Bloody corpses of young men, the rope of the gibbet hangs heavily, the bullets of princes are flying, the creatures of power 
laugh aloud, we come back to the laughter, and all these things bear fruits, and they are good. Now, of course, uh, we, we should point out this idea of, of the corpses written, of course, so early before, obviously, the, ter the tragic war that we're going to get to here in a few moments when we start talking about drum taps poems comes to mind as we play this game. But notice as well the idea that there is fruit that has to be born. Think about the power of leaves of grass as the title. And to say that all these things bear fruits and they are good, two observations. First is obviously this is a theodicy, go back to our big five. That is to say all the terrible deaths of young soldiers. We think about that final line in the opera Les Mis, don't we? It all is for a purpose. In other words, there is a theodicy that says all of this dead was necessary for this. Now, obviously, Whitman is going to be celebrating America to Europe in this regard. By the way, the whole notion of they are good takes us back, obviously, biblical references to Genesis 1, and God saw that it was good over and over again. I told you guys, I think Whitman's having a lot of fun as he plays uh, the game of, uh, of writing these poems. And then he has those several times with they to follow. Those corpses of young men, those martyrs, and go back to starting from Pominach 5 to hear his use of that word martyr, those martyrs that hang from the gibbets, those hearts pierced by the gray lead, cold and motionless as they seem, live elsewhere with unslaughtered vitality. Just go back and read the final lines of passage 6 of Song of Myself, and the idea that growth comes from death, compelling idea. And then he continues from those to they. They live in other young men, O oh, kings. And so notice the exclamation point. Now we're talking directly to the kings. This idea that we live through our past, that as we've said it, and we learned from our study of uh, Whitman, Leaves of Grass, the new is the new. The N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. Notice, they live in other young men, O oh, kings. And we think about this young men, and we go back to, for example, I hear America singing in a number of other poems. They live in brothers, again, ready to defy you. Again, the Promethean spirit of this poem is self-evident, right? They were purified by death. It's almost religious language here. They were purified by death. They were taught and exalted. Um, you know, again, th this idea that we will not forget. And, and in many ways, I mean, we haven't said this a lot. Uh, because we're getting ready for drum taps. And I think a poem like this definitely gets us ready for our study of drum taps. I think Whitman wrote Leaves of Grass for a lot of reasons, but I think one of them was to memorialize, to remind us as Americans what it is that was necessary to produce this amazing, this precious civilization that we call America, right? With all of its obvious flaws, right? I mean, slaves is mentioned in the very first line of this poem, no doubt. He says it this way to finish the poem now. Not a grave of the murdered for freedom, but grows seed for freedom and its turn to bear seed. In other words, again, we're, we're back to this idea of bearing fruit. We're back to the idea of, of leaves of grass. Which the winds carry afar and re-sow and the rains and the snows nourish. Now, go back to Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, and we're playing the same game again if, if winter come can spring thee far behind. Is an idea carried across the universes that spark same idea, and I think Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, and Shelley's, obviously, his entire set of poems, informs a whole lot of Lisa Grass. Then from not a grave to not a disembodied spirit can the weapons of tyrants let loose. Notice the inversion of the syntax. We've seen this already in Lisa Grass. Again, so much of this is being set up for us, obviously, the use of the word tyrants. But it stalks, this is again the phantom, the phantom of freedom. It stalks invisibly over the earth. And then notice your, your three ING uh, words here. Whispering, counseling, cautioning. And in some ways, there it is. That's what Whitman himself obviously wishes to be as a poet, as an artist. And then the famous line of this poem. Liberty, let others despair of you. Notice the dash. I never despair of you. We're back, of course, to hope and faith at the beginning of the poem. And then notice, Whitman loves to finish many of his poems with these kinds of rhetorical questions. Possibly asked to the reader, possibly asked to someone specifically that's maybe been identified. I'll let you decide how this one works for you. Is the house shut? Is the master away? Nevertheless, be ready. Be not weary of watching. He will soon return. His messengers come anon. Now, this idea that Whitman is having fun while he's writing... Um, I think he is, and I think he's smiling all the time that he plays little games like this. Whitman's audience would have understood 
that what he's doing right here is playing a biblical game, a Christian New Testament game. Uh, Luke 21, 34 comes to mind, this idea of being ready, obviously. Uh, Matthew 25 comes to mind. This idea that the servant is coming back, or the master is coming back, and the servant had better be ready, prepared, being ready. Um, he will soon return. This, this idea of always getting ready. Notice, soon return takes us back to the opening word suddenly, right? And with that in mind, obviously the question is, it's messengers, notice not singular, it's plural, which begs the question, is Whitman thinking of himself as one of those in one of the very earliest poems of Leaves of Grass? Let's finish it 2A. Well, I think he's arguing that true artists always defy tyrants, always challenge the status quo of the powerful. The spirit of the dreamer as well, another message here, lives on in the next generation. And the next generation's job is to remember the fallen, to remember those uh, corpses uh, lying in, in graves. At 2B, notice all the poetic elements that are a part of Leaves of Grass. This is again pre-1855 poem, so it's a, really, it's a really fascinating poem for us to study. We've got direct address, we've got the rhetorical questions at the close of the poem, and you could probably write down at least five or six others that will remind you of other poems that you've already read, but notice this is in some ways predicting what's going to happen for starting from Pamanak and other, you know, Song of Myself and other poems, right? At 3A, well, where are we going to go with this? Well, obviously Thoreau's civil disobedience comes to mind. I mentioned Marx's Communist Manifesto of 1845. I want to I mention as well one of the most precious speeches in American thought, which is, of course, I Have a Dream speech, that precious speech of uh, 1963. I think that there's some way to read that in relationship to a poem like this as well. Finally, at 3B, how are we going to own a poem like this for ourselves? How about this? Do you think that true revolutionaries live on in the next generation? Or do you feel yourself a part of the revolutionary spirit of Thomas Jefferson and, and dare I say it, Whitman? Um, and then finally, do you think that Walt Whitman himself is one of these contrarians, one of these revolutionary iconoclasts, which has to be studied and embraced? I hope that you're at least gesturing towards that study. Thank you.